Hello, lovelies. You're listening to episode 24 of the Broken Enchantments podcast, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. That's me. I hope you enjoy this episode, and I would love to connect with you on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can check out the links below. Now let's get to the story. A scream woke Janir. She had been enjoying a blissfully dreamless sleep when someone in the servants' quarters below let off a frightful shriek. Janir lay with her eyes open, perfectly still, poised to flee. Indistinct, angry shouts and a flurry of several women yelling rose from below. There came a clang, and they silenced. Deciding that it must have been the servants playing pranks on one another, Janir rolled over. Below, the women calmed. Janir closed her eyes, settling back into her blankets. Clawing, scratching, and grunting came from outside the window. At first, she ignored it. Then something tapped on the glass. Opening her eyes, Janir found the shape of a person framed in the window. Her heart raced. Was it an assassin sent by one of the disgruntled High Lords? He could have been sent by the Lord Argatalum. It had been weeks, and Lucan might have returned to Adasha. There were plenty of other people who would want to kill her, especially now that word had gotten out among the nobles. There was no time to debate who had sent him. She needed to concern herself with escaping the assassin. Should she hide and pretend not to be here? She doubted she could run fast enough with him so close, yet she loathed the idea of killing again. No, loathed was the wrong word. It sickened her made her chest constrict and her throat tighten. But she needed to keep her head together. If anything happened to her, she didn't want to think about what would become of Armandius. She collected herself and slid off the far side of the mattress, putting it between her and the window. Crouched in the shadow of her bed, Janir frantically tried to think of what to do as the figure worked the latch on the window loose and swung it open. Fear and survival instinct quickly quieted her conscience. Her carcotton were across the room in the wardrobe. No weapons, no defense. Even if she screamed, she doubted that anyone would arrive in time to help her. Glancing around in a fraught search, Janir spotted the tall, wrought iron candle stand beside her night table. Seizing it, she waited, praying that the assassin would just decide that he had the wrong room and leave. He landed on the floor with a heavy thud and disgruntled muttering. Certainly not a quiet assassin. His footsteps fumbled as he tried to regain his balance. He walked aimlessly, meandering calmly about the room. Fighting to keep the sound of her rapid breathing in check, she waited for the assassin to come within range. If she struck too soon, she would spoil her tiny advantage. Finally, his polished boots came into view along with a light-colored portion of legging. Not the shade Janir would have expected an assassin to wear. Waiting. Her every muscle taut as a painter's canvas, Janir was able to make out the outline of his head. She swung as hard as she could. He let off a yelp and ducked. The candle stand barely nicked his forehead, candlesticks flying in all directions. The assassin tripped on the edge of the rug and fell flat on his back. She raised the stand over her head with some difficulty and prepared to swing down. Janir, it's me! He screamed, clutching his forehead. There was a faint cracking along the walls, and the other candles flared to life. Junior squinted, not lowering the improvised weapon in her clenched fist until she was certain. Carryle, you little briar thorn in the arse! She threw down the candle stand and let it clang as it fell. What in the name of all the essences are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you. Carryle clambered to his feet and brushed off his courtly attire. Look what Da did to me! he exclaimed, motioning to his pale blue tunic and leggings. He took my robe, and this is all I had to wear. The enchanter seemed to consider the loss of his unusual, much too large, grayish-brown robe akin to an amputation. I have a guard outside my door, so I had to go out the window. You assume far too much by entering my chambers in the middle of the night. Janir might have been raised a country hooligan, but she still had a sense of propriety. 
This was improper. Indecent. As if I don't know. This is the eighth room I've checked in the past half hour. But when you attacked me with the furniture, I was pretty sure I had the right one. I'm in my nightgown. And barefoot. I've seen you barefoot before, the enchanter said with a dismissive gesture. And if you were worried, why didn't you just call for the guards? That had not occurred to her. She was used to Castle Kayerson, where they didn't even have hall boys, much less guards stationed outside at night. Get out. Junior snarled. Get out now. You are the last person in the world I would want visiting my bedroom in this hour. Now get out before I get my car cotton. Really? The last person in the world? Carl scoffed. He caught her off guard with that. Well, maybe not the last, but certainly not the first. Junior yelled, twice as angry that he'd flustered her. Ooh! Carl's brows wiggled mischievously. Who's the first? That was it. Janir smacked his cheek without mercy. Tears of pain welled in his eyes. He blinked for a moment before speaking again. Was that really necessary? Get out. This time her tone was cold, dangerous. Carl must have sensed the simmering hostility in her words. He raised his hands in a placating gesture and backed out of range. Okay, okay. I just wanted to tell you that there's going to be a war. War? With who? Her anger was almost forgotten in a moment. Alarm shivered down her spine. She knew enough to know wars were sorry, messy, wretched affairs. She had already seen so much death. She didn't want to see any more. The Slavish. Their armies are on the move. Didn't you notice that there were an awful lot of soldiers in the practice yards this morning? Well, I had no reason to suspect that there was any more than normal. There was. The Slavish and us have been having minor skirmishes since spring, but now the Slavish are getting serious. So, naturally, we are too. Just as Lucan said. Carl nodded. It looks like the Argotolums will be fighting with them. Chenier's chest tightened all over again. Argotolums in a war with Brevians. It had happened once before, and it had not ended well. Hundreds of Slavish and Brevian soldiers and peasants alike had been slaughtered in the bloodbath, and no one knew exactly how many had been maimed, or enslaved, or both. Though slave trading was supposed to be outlawed in Brevia, many provinces had started a practice they called recompense. Enemy soldiers were supposed to work for Brevians until they repaid the damages they had caused in the wars. Unfortunately, There was no real way to prove how much damage any one soldier had or had not caused. Most would be recompensing for life. Do you suppose that one of the Slavish sultans might have wanted the key of Amatons? Carl wondered. Maybe the Vanmar sultan? Janir's brow wrinkled. Why would you think that? Well, it's common knowledge that the Argotolums made an alliance with the Vanmars some twenty years ago, and that alliance has been a strong one ever since. Carl pointed out. It's also common knowledge that the Von Mars have a thing for power and are not at all squeamish about using magic. For centuries, the Von Mars have bickered amongst themselves and with Slavin's three other ruling houses, the Ariums, the Sarthrins, and the Berdamons, for control of Slavin. They fought with swords and spells, with murder and marriages, until one of them beat the others into temporary submission. Sometimes decades went by between conflicts, but sooner or later, the four houses always went at each other's throats again. Around two decades earlier, a Von Mar Sultan had been clever enough to make an alliance with the Argotolums against the enchanted arsenal of his enemies. Needless to say, the Argotolums had easily crushed the magical weapons and the enchanters wielding them. Since then, the Von Mars had ruled the greater portion of Slavin, and in exchange kept the Argotolums in supply of slaves, silk, spices, and all the luxuries and necessities that they lacked in the Staspen Waste. Janir shrugged. I suppose anything's possible. She considered everything for a moment. Thank you for those tidbits, Carl. Now you have a choice to make. I do? Yes. Shall you walk out the door or be thrown out the window? With his scrawny build, Junior decided he was light enough she probably could throw him if she put her mind to it. 
walk out the door. Carl hastily replied, definitely walk out the door. Always walk out the door. The enchanter retreated, scurrying off like a pale blue mouse. Janir locked it after him and made sure the windows were secured again. Then she collected her carcotton from the wardrobe and stuffed them under her pillow. She might not be able to fend off anyone truly dangerous, but at least she could give them a nasty surprise. This has been the Broken Enchantments podcast. Thank you for listening. Check out my Patreon for early access to episodes, bonus content, and lots of patrons-only freebies. You can learn more at elizabethwheatley.com. And don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.